Story 5, Intelligence Test. Pavel Chekhov checked the charge in his phaser for the sixth time, causing the head of the security, de security detail to repress a smile for the fifth time. You'd think he hadn't transported down to an unknown planet ever before, the security man thought. But then, Galloway thought, I suppose you had better never lose that edge, that hyper-awareness. No matter what the texts that the sensors said about the air and gravity and so on, there were always surprises. Always. The smell, the taste of the air, the gravity, bugs, noises, the feel of a planet were always different from what you thought they would be. Galloway shrugged mentally. He'd been born and raised in the light gravity of Mars, and to him, Earth, and to him, Earth was strange and exotic. It was only through constant exercise to strengthen his muscles to be able to withstand the much higher gravity of Earth that he had been able to enter and graduate from Starfleet Security Forces School. One thing the instructors there had taught him, watch your commanding officer like a hawk. Watch out for the, watch out for the glory seekers, old Sergeant Major Workman had told them. Watch out for the ones who think the new mud, mud ball is just like where they grew up. Watch out for the young princes and nobles from some of those two by four kingdoms. They might have gotten through the academy, but they still think other life forms should obey orders. Watch out for the, oh, look at the wonder of it all types. They'll lead you right into a swamp or some kind of energy drain or something. And watch out for the xenophobes. They're the kind that will blast anything that doesn't have two legs, two arms, and speak universal English. Franson, the one-armed, one-legged lesson in what not to do, had told them, don't think all officers are thickheads because they aren't. You don't buy commissions in Starfleet. You earn them. But there are some who think they know everything, know so much they've lost all practical sense at all. Look at me. I had a young lieutenant who thought a Rogelian shocker worm was safe because it was pretty. Galloway kept an eye on Lieutenant Commander Chekhov. It was Galloway's first tour on the Enterprise, but he'd seen Chekhov's type before, on the Leo, the Jason, the Nelson, that sharp young loot first who had been on the Thelony, the one who thought his speed and accuracy with the phaser was all anyone needed, ambitious, eager for adventure, eager to prove himself or herself against nature, the universe, and the laws of probability. Sir, the transporter chief said, and Chekhov motioned Galloway and the four others forward. They stepped up onto the, onto the focusing discs on the transporter stage. A little tense, Chekhov nodded to the transporter chief. Galloway heard the rising whine and felt the strange, not unpleasant sensation of the electronic scan of his body. The transporter room flickered and fragmented before him, and the red sky of Kappa Rho 4 dissolved in. The drag of the heavier gravity almost knocked him to his knees, but Galloway stiffened his legs and took it. He would never give in, never let any planet defeat him, not unless it defeated the others first. Chekhov switched on his tricorder and did a sweep, walking around the weapons-ready group, aiming outward. That gave Galloway time to adjust to the crushing gravity. It seemed to affect the others, too, as they moved slower, but to Martian-born Galloway, it was torture. The planet was grim. A red giant sun bathed everything in crimson, and it was oppressively hot. The ground was gray with purple and green-gray vegetation, small, stunted plants growing low to the rocky soil. Who would ever want to live here? Friedman asked. Quiet, Galloway said easily. He was listening. The winds were strong, gusting and lessening. Far off, he could see a sandstorm boiling into the atmosphere. He took a few steps toward the edge of the hilltop, which had been their vantage point landing focus and saw a wide stretch of gray-green valley and a trace of something shiny, which could have been a stream. I don't think anyone wants to live here, Chekhov said, putting his strike order back. But we have to assess it, add it to the preliminary survey charts. Friedman nodded. It can't all be like Mira, huh, Commander? Myra had been a lush, semi-tropical planet with great oceans, a million islands, and a native humanoid race who thought the people from the stars were gods. Chekhov smiled and pulled out his communicator, flipping it open. Enterprise, this is Chekhov. Mr. Chekhov, Spock answered. Preliminary survey report, sir. Gravity 1.842, as expected. Air thick and hot, but breathable. But it's an inhospitable place, sir. Oh, Spock responded. 
and Chekhov remembered that the planet Vulcan's mean temperatures mean temperature was 140 degrees, and that to many this planet would seem like a winter wonderland compared with Vulcan. Proceed, Mr. Chekhov. Report back in one hour. Aye, sir. Chekhov out. He pointed toward the valley. Let's go. Galloway led them down over the sharp stones and around the long thorn plants until they were on the flat land, where Chekhov called a rest. Everyone was sweating, uncomfortable, and exhausted from the gravity, which was more than three quarters more than Earth's. But to Galloway, it was several times the gravity to which he had been born. His face was drawn, but he kept the same stern and passive face he always did. No one was going to know. He was all but ready to collapse. Coming down the hill had been like carrying several men on his back. Chekhov checked the samples, which two of the security men had been charged with gathering. A snip of thorn bush, several rock samples, an armored beetle, still rolled up in a defensive ball, and a flask of air. The Russian-born officer looked at the beetle carefully. Nature had so many methods of self-protection. Camouflage, scales, teeth, claws, imitation and mimicry, muscles. This bug could be swallowed and pass right through its predator and unroll later and go on about its business with only a short interruption in its life. Chekhov thought about the pretty, inoffensive-looking Aminiar fifth column arachnid. Its method of obtaining food was to sit in some exposed position, its fiery cilia waving in the breeze until it was attacked. It would then fold itself into a tight knot of overlapping chitin plates coated with an acid-resistant gel and let itself be swallowed. Once inside the one who had eaten it, it expanded, stuck out legs to prevent regurgitation, then ate its way to the creature's heart, guided by the vibrations. It then used the corpse to lay eggs and to feed itself until the eggs were hatched. A grim but violent reminder that everything pretty is not safe, Chekhov thought. All right, he said, motioning them on. At the end of the hour, he contacted the Enterprise again. Frankly, Mr. Spock, the mineral content here is very low, very little iron. The heavy gravity simply comes from a lot, a lot of rock. Not exactly a technical analysis, Mr. Chekhov, but accurate enough in its way. Continue for another hour. Lieutenant Nakashima in the other hemisphere reports similar findings. Aye, sir. Chekhov out. He motioned to Galloway, who got the exhausted security men to their feet. They crossed the valley and with great effort scaled the low hills on the north. Galloway, in the lead, was the first to find the next thing of interest. There was a wide, low cave and a scuffed flat area before it. Bones of animals and pits of some kind of fruit or vegetable littered the perimeter, forming an almost defensive fence. Careful, Galloway cautioned his phaser in his hand. Phasers on stun, Chekhov ordered. Galloway gave him a dark look. Sometimes stunning worked, but with certain creatures with a different nervous system, it only irritated them, made them angry. But he turned his phaser to stun and stepped over the bone fence. It came out of the cave like a striking snake, one long lunge going straight for Galloway's legs. He fired and the creature jerked, but his mouth still clamped over Galloway's left leg. Five other phasers struck it at that moment and the creature released him, screaming in a thin high cry. It was wide and long, a double whip of muscle, something like a paired snake. Its tail was as big as a Terran alligator, only smooth, gray, and mottled. It twisted, and the tail knocked Lieutenant Commander Chekhov off his feet and against a rock. Then it bolted straight back into the cave. Chekhov rose shakily, struggling against pain, exhaustion, and the gravity of Kappa Rho 4. He went at once to where they had laid out Galloway. He was bleeding from lacerations, but his tough Starfleet boot had protected him fairly well. Chekhov reached for his communicator to have them beamed up, but he pulled forth a handful of shattered parts. Even then, they might have patched some molecular blocks together, but another one had been ripped loose and lost somewhere in the dirt. That's all right, Chekhov said. Less than an hour. They'll miss our report and come for us. Galloway couldn't help glowering as the, mere, as the communicators were usually not issued to mere security personnel. But Friedman had bandaged his leg with a medical spray, and at least he'd get off this accursed planet where he weighed several times his real weight. As long as that whatever it, what, as long as that whatever it was wasn't lethal, Galloway reminded Chekhov. 
as Friedman gave him a booster shot of Omni immunizer. We'll just wait, Chekhov said. The trouble was, the whatever it was had friends. They came slithering out of caves all over the hill, rippling over the boulders and rocks, wide jaws spreading, coming with a speed which seemed incredible, considering the gravity. Phasers on kill, Chekhov ordered. The security men formed a ring, firing with great accuracy, disintegrating the whatever snakes right and left. I feel like General Custer, Galloway said, blasting one of the creatures as it launched itself from a rock. Then, suddenly, they were gone. A few slithering sounds, then silence. We've beaten them, Friedman said happily. Galloway looked at him with disgust. Haven't you ever heard of regrouping your forces? You mean uh, they'll come again? Friedman, anything which attacks as vigorously as they did will, t will attack again, this time probably from a different angle. Chekhov looked thoughtful for a moment. Friedman, put Sergeant Galloway up on that rock, the highest one, quickly. Yes, sir, Friedman responded. Hey, what? Quickly, Chekhov snapped. He pointed at the others. Get up on a rock. The bigger, the better. Move. What's he up to? Friedman whispered to Galloway as they shoved him up on a large boulder, sweating and grunting. It was like lifting a safe. I don't know, maybe the ground erupted. The whatever snakes twisted into the air, dirt flying, their tails slashing back and forth before they fell into the hole they had dug in the midst of the party's area. A boulder tipped and rolled over. A snake's sharp teeth clamped on the lower left leg of one of the men who had lifted Galloway up. Friedman couldn't fire, for the phaser would also disintegrate the man who was too tightly in contact. He fumbled at switching his stun, and Chekhov beat him to it. The whatever snake reared back, releasing the security man, and Galloway himself disintegrated the beast. The large rock upon which Chekhov stood was undermined and started to roll. The Starfleet officer ran over the rolling rock, much like a logger might, and leaped to another rock. Dirt. Rocks, boulders toppled into the hole carved out beneath them by the savage snakes. Another boulder shook and a security man lost his balance and sprawled, falling with a scream into the churning pit, the boulder rolling on top of him. Friedman scrambled up, slipped, and fell to the ground at the edge of the newly formed pit. He caught his balance and dodged between rocks just as a whatever snake struck at him. He clawed his way up Galloway's boulder and started to help him off. No, the sergeant growled. Laboriously, he got up on one elbow and fired with deliberate speed into the boiling snake pit below him, disintegrating one after another of the creatures. Chekhov added his fire to that of Galloway, aiming at keeping the thick-bodied creatures away from undermining the boulder on which Galloway rested. Then there was a flurry of activity in the pit and spumes of dirt shot into the air, falling swiftly to the ground as the snakes tunneled into the soil and got away. A long moment of silence followed, and then Galloway let out a long sigh. He looked at Chekhov with new respect. The officer hadn't panicked. He'd outthought the vicious creatures and saved them all, but the Russian officer looked worried. Sir? Yes, Galloway? What's the matter? Do you think they'll return? I don't know, but Chekhov hesitated. Suppose those were intelligent life? Galloway blinked. Whatever snakes had been quite shrewd in their unusual mass attack, but that didn't make them intelligent. Intelligent creatures, self-aware minds, had a special status in Federation rules. The Prime Directive said Starfleet representatives were not to interfere. Yet, surely it might be taken into account they were attacked first. But then, Galloway knew, those admirals and politicians back on Earth and in the Grand Council take a different, broader view. Not being on the ground, as it were, they could hold more easily to lofty ideals of non-interference. But when something tries to eat you, you fight back as best you can, and you don't ask it to take a Federation intelligence test as it's trying to pull you into its lair. His leg throbbed, but he ordered Friedman to take care of the other man who'd been bitten. He looked at Chekhov and saw the dark-haired young officer look at his watch. Think it's all right to get off the rocks? he asked. Chekhov shook his head. Let's just stay here. We have two wounded and nothing to prove by going on. One thing, sir, Galloway said, and Chekhov looked at him. Whether those snakes were intelligent or not. Hey, Sarge, Friedman complained, looking up from the leg he was spraying. How are you going to prove that one? How are you going to prove that one way or another? 
No, he's right, Chekhov said. We have about 20 minutes. They'll miss us and do a scan and probably transport down another team. Galloway groaned. Glaser had the reserve duty. He'd just love to rescue Galloway. But 20 minutes could be a lifetime, he thought, or what was left of one. What would those snakes try next? I think I have the test, Chekhov said from atop his rock. The trouble is, if the snakes pass it, they might have some serious trouble. So they sat and waited. Chekhov explained his idea, but no one commented except Galloway, who was really only being polite. Sounds reasonable to me, Commander. It was hot. They were tired, sweaty, exhausted. Their breathing labored and their bodies like lead. Chekhov kept an eye across the valley, and when he saw the sparkle of six columns of light, he stood up and waved. Spock raised one eyebrow. And what was this test of intelligence of yours, Mr. Chekhov? Well, sir, there are a lot of animals in the galaxy who attack on sight, no doubt of that, to defend territory or family, to get food or to defend food. But they have no egos, which is a function of intelligence and self-awareness. Spock said nothing, patient with the obvious. If hurt, an animal might attack and attack again. But on the whole, non-self-aware creatures will run when they are attacked or hurt. When we encountered the first whatever snake, we were invading its territory. When they attacked in concert, it was to defend territory, and possibly for food, too. So if they, t so if they attacked another time, it was a function of some kind of intelligence. And if they didn't attack because they had reasoned out it was futile? Chekhov grinned slyly. Then they would be of a high enough intelligence for us not to bother them again. Seems to me you win either way, Mr. Chekhov. They don't attack, you're saved, and they are intelligent. They do attack, and they are intelligent. That is not problem-solving, Mr. Chekhov. No, sir, but it is survival. Granted. What will your recommendation be, then? Unsuitable planet for colonization. Too hot, gravity more than recommended limits, and hostile, possibly intelligent life forms. Mr. Nakashima agrees. Log it. Yes, sir. Chekhov turned to leave, and Spock stopped him. Mr. Chekhov, in the future, please observe the more standard forms of intelligence determination. I will if I can, Mr. Spock. I will if I can. <laughs>